Attacks can't be prevented, but they can be stopped. Modern cyber attackers have already made it inside your network, but you have the upper hand. Find and eradicate threats with extra hop network detection and response and shut them out before real damage is done. Learn the advanced techniques attackers are using and how extra hop stops them with a live attack simulation. Register at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. That's extra H-O-P. Imagine this scenario. You're out of the office unexpectedly and a colleague pings you because they need access to some system you have credentials for. Now, my listeners would never send passwords over email or Slack. But what about your coworkers? How many organizations out there are sending logins back and forth in plain text? Worse yet, how many just store all of their logins on a shared spreadsheet? Keeper Security's password management platform locks down logins, payment cards, and more in a patented zero-knowledge encrypted vault. Sign up for a Keeper free trial today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Keeper. CyberGRX brings a revolutionary approach to third-party cyber risk management. Using sophisticated data analytics, real-world attack scenarios, and real-time threat intelligence, CyberGRX provides a complete portfolio analysis of a company's third-party ecosystem, helping the world's leading businesses prioritize their risks and make smart decisions. Interested in learning more? Head over to securityweekly.com forward slash CyberGRX and demo the world's biggest third-party exchange. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Do you have any specific guests or topics that you want us to cover in one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Now for the Enterprise Security Weekly news. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash ESW264 if you want to see the notes from this uh, episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. Uh, Not only links to the stories there, uh, I typically, depending on how much time I have, uh, put some comments in there. For this acquisition of, uh, or intended acquisition of Mandiant by Google, uh, it's basically a blog post that I shoved in into the show notes here. What do you guys were? Were you guys as surprised as uh, everybody else when you heard about this? Yeah, believe it or not, I didn't. I mean, it's not that I couldn't have seen it coming. It's just that I hadn't heard any rumors. The rumors had, I think, if I recall correctly, all been swirling around the Microsoft off- offer. Yeah, um, we talked about that. And uh, yeah, and it just kind of out of the blue smacked us in the face, like boom. Okay, nope, it's Google. And it's like, whoa, where'd that come from? Didn't see that coming. So no, in that sense, I can't say that I did see it coming, but. You know, when you look at it logically, um, you know, Microsoft is essentially a security company. I think as we as we move forward, Google is becoming more and more of a security company. Um, yeah, and I've been saying for a long time that cybersecurity in general is ripe for roll-ups. And roll-ups will occur generally one of two ways, either with uh, large quantities, multi-billions of dollars of private equity funds rolling up, you know, three, four, five big firms into one major platform offering, or as we can see happening potentially here, the uh, the big companies with uh, billions, if not trillions, on their on their cash balances available to make acquisitions, looking at potentially doing similar roll-ups. So I don't think it's it's surprising in a in a technical way. I don't think it's surprising in a business way. I just think it snuck up on me on the back of the Microsoft stuff. I went through Google's history and couldn't find a single case of them acquiring a company that had significant services. You know, so so I, I think that's part of the reason people were shocked. And I, I think also people didn't realize how many products Mandiant actually had. You know, they thought of FireEye as kind of the product side. Um, but really kind of the way they grew and the way they separated, uh, they both left with with both products and services, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure how they chopped up chopped up that uh, that egg, so to speak. But um, you know, as far as Google having services, you know, I feel like modern incident response and modern cybersecurity has to be wrapped in some level of human resources. If we're staring at the perennial millions of right. of SOC analysts unable to find people that can deliver on cybersecurity expertise and knowledge, if you're staring at that problem. You know how do the how do the technologies in this particular case solve the problem without human beings being involved at all of the qu- companies buying the products? And I don't think they can. I think you pretty much have to have some kind of services to deliver it at the highest level level capable, like Google wants to do on the back of the Mandiant project. And I think Katie? if we go back a couple of weeks to when we were talking about the CB Insights report and looking at 
where the investment is coming from, where the innovation is coming from, and then just looking at Google in general, uh, GCP in particular, and its place in the market, they've definitely been scrapping and vying for market share for a long time. And this changes the game for them. I really think it does in terms of their market position as a security focused, security conscious company. And, you know, this, this is a really serious acquisition. Not that, not that others that they've made haven't been serious, but this is the biggest one they've made. This is a player with a reputation in the market. And as you said, a great product portfolio that is, is both wide and deep. And so in that sense, I, I don't think I was that surprised when I heard this. I thought, oh, yeah, that makes more sense versus, wait, where did this come from? So uh, I do want to bring up another point that Adrian put in the show notes there about uh, he did some throwback data, which I thought was really cool. Um, the acquisition of, uh, where was it? Foundstone was, shoot, I lost it now, of course. 86. Oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, 86 million. Um, McAfee's acquisition of Foundstone and Symantec's acquisition of a firm I once worked for called At Stake was 48 million. Um, but I think that, you know, when we look at, let's say that this is an acquisition of a professional services firm, um, I really don't think it is because we talked about this on previous episodes. Where do we draw the line between professional services today and managed services as a product, right? If you take that and put it on a spectrum, yes. pure pro serve on one end, pure product on the other end, in the middle somewhere in there is SaaS products that are partially managed and enabled by some human capabilities. Like it gets very fuzzy in the middle. And I think what you're seeing here is it's not really a professional services org that they're buying. I think it's some kind of fuzzy middle. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's also worth mentioning that the product side will probably get branded Google Cloud, Google Security, something like that. But there's no way this deal gets done. You know, there's too much brand equity in Bandi Mandiant to mess with you know, the, the consulting firm there, you know, and, and, and those services, I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm predicting, you know, that they leave that fairly untouched you know, ooh, after this acquisition. Ooh, I might, I might take the counterpoint on that. I've seen too many companies acquire services or services esque companies and completely screw up the brands to really say that Google's smarter than that. I would like to think that they are, but I get a hundred percent see them tanking the Mandiant brand and being like, ah, oh, you know what? We don't need that. It's a Google brand. So those weren't five five point four billion dollar acquisitions, and those didn't have Kevin Mandy at the helm. That's true, those, but those they are also points. aren't the big the big ego that is the term Google. I mean, how many people do we know that you know say, "Oh, I work for Google" or "I'm from Google," right? And it comes with this cachet of Google, Google, Google. There's a certain level of brand equity and brand egoism that will come with that, right? Where they're just going to say, "Well, right. sure." Maybe it's Mandiant's Google or Mandiant by Google or something like that. And eventually you may just see the Mandiant brand fade. But but hearing the word Mandiant, I bet if you did scientific studies, board members, blood pressure and, and pulses would lower <laughs> ju just upon hearing the word Mandiant right after a breach. Oh, yeah. You hired they might, Mandiant? Oh. And they might go shooting through the roof when they hear the word Google. So, hey, you're probably right. Who knows? <laughs> right. And and whether this is Google or GCP, you've got the perception to deal with because there is a little bit of a clash there. Hey, search data mining company. Oh, security company. It's still the perception in the market, even though they're separate entities. Yeah. You know, I don't know Kevin Mandia, so I have absolutely no idea. But... If I were in his position, I'd probably make the term sheet include some sort of lengthy period where Mandiant was left alone significantly. I mean, yeah, it happens that's be... naturally in any acquisition for, you know, usually at least 18 months, but. <laughs> and he actually, he worked at Foundstone. Uh, and he's been an investor for a while. So, you know, he's, he's a pretty savvy guy, you know, and I think he realizes the the equity that they have in that brand. And I'd be yeah. really surprised to see them check out that brand. I'm thinking a friendly wager that we can uh, re re-examine in about five years. Let's let's okay. figure that out. <laughs>
No, well, that right. was def- I'll take that. definitely longer than my 18 month statement. So sure. No, eight, 18 months, Mandy, and still sticking around. The brand has way more equity than that. But sure. you know, when you're pushing a, a three to five year window, it could definitely fade to zero. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it took wow. a while yeah. for that. It took a while for that to happen. To I, I feel like it happened quicker with At Stake than with Foundstone. I feel like Foundstone, that like that culture, like they kept releasing like Hack Me Bank and and, and like these cool yeah. projects and stuff like that for a while after the well, acquisition. That was a function of McAfee's doing, right? McAfee was smart enough not to completely shit or sorry, completely (laughs) dump the brand, right? Symantec did the opposite. They were completely clueless and they just tanked the brand day one. They said, it's gone. Not only that, but they, you know, little known fact, they did nothing to retain the talent, the actual pen testers and researchers that were on the Abstag team. Literally day one, the entire West Coast office didn't sign the new agreement to join Symantec and formed ISEC partners. Day one oh, yeah. of acquisition of that stake. So, you know, Symantec just completely botched that acquisition. And I think McAfee was a little bit smarter and kept the Foundstone brand out around for a period of time and then eventually disposed of that as well. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you called out the the details there because I I could not find it reported anywhere what, what they paid for at stake. I, I had to actually dig around and, and find a 10Q on Edgar uh, to, yeah. to pull that out. Yeah, I actually didn't know either because I can tell you as an individual consultant who had been there for, I don't know, a handful of years, I did get three grand. So you can do the math beyond that. <laughs> All right. Um, don't want to spend too long on that. we got a couple other interesting items here like uh, help systems picking up alert logic. Uh, I, I think I might have missed a few, but there's at least – uh, this is at least the 11th uh, cybersecurity acquisition that Help System has made since 2019. Do you know? Do you know off the top of your head, Adrian, what um, what the cross section of types of acquisitions they've done? I I don't have that anywhere near handy. The the cross section of what? The types of acquisitions, as far as what types of cybersecurity companies they're yeah. attempting to roll up. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, we got some of the names of them here, but um, oh, yeah. Yeah, everything from en- endpoint DLP to uh, email security, uh, it's really all over the place. Beyond security uh, it w- was uh, PAM. Um, wait, is that right? Or is that Beyond Trust? No, I think I'm, I'm uh, getting Beyond Security mixed up with Beyond Trust. Digital defense is, is uh, vulnerability management, which kind of pairs well with core security, which they already had. Which you know, one of the things Core Security does is pull in your Vuln scan uh, results, and they've got Cobalt uh, Strike as well. Uh, I think some of them are uh, identity and access management. So it's really, it looks like they're trying to complete the set. Yeah, it could be that for sure. It could be that they're trying to complete the set and get the breadth of of um, company types in there so they can roll up and say you can buy one thing from us, buy an ELA enterprise license agreement that covers all of these properties potentially someday. Or another thing that I did notice in those brands, and I don't know how true this is, but I did notice that those brands in general across the board never really got to the point where that they were selling absolutely enormous enterprise level deals. Oh, absolutely. So is, yeah. Could this, it's could this very be targeted. a target right at, the, right at the high end of commercial, low end of enterprise, kind of that middle gap and filling in something so. very unique right there? Same thing with Alert Logic. That That's always been Alert Logic's, um, you know, the, the segment of the market that they've gone after as well. So yep. that and yeah, so that there's, totally makes sense. Yeah, a couple different ways you can tend to roll up. You can roll up by tech on a broad platform level, or you can roll up by vertical, or you can roll up by horizontal, as in the case that I just described, as far as like type of firmographic you're targeting with the businesses. Yeah, cu- customer segment, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and Tripwire, I didn't. I don't think we even reported on that. I must have missed the Tripwire acquisition announcement. So they got that from uh, Bel- Belden, I think was the name of the company. It's like a... Um, industrial tech company. Wow. No, I don't remember that crossing my my news uh, news feeds either. And they Tripwire had a... been doing their their part to to really become a bigger player by acquisition in the security space because if you look at the most recent ones, they're almost entirely in security. So, you know, there's a lot of money there. They're they're vying for a spot in that top ten, I think. 
Yeah, so they, they got, uh, I think, majority owned by uh, PE Shop when all this started. But they were effectively uh, an IBM software shop. You know, they, I think they're the world's largest independent uh, uh, i-series software shop before 2019. And now, all of a sudden, they're, they're this, you know, pretty sizable uh, cybersecurity vendor. Yeah. All right, so we we now have funding rumors. I guess this is going to be a thing as as uh, funding rounds get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, we're going to start seeing rumors, uh, just like with acquisitions, but before a funding round is announced, maybe. So I, I can't remember the last time I saw a rumor about a funding round, but we've got one on abnormal security and uh, so many fun phrases. Like like as a writer, you can put together with a company called Abnormal Security. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, abnormal security funding is, is right. You know, we're talking a 250, $300 million round, which would put them well into unicorn territory. That would make them the 50th. I, I counted this morning. We've got 49 unicorns up, uh, six unicorns from this time last month. And this would abnormal security. If they raise this round soon, they, they can be the 50th. Wow, that's uh, that's something, right? 50, 50 cyber unicorns. You know, this one it sounds like they're trying to raise between two hundred fifty and three hundred million on a four billion number. Um, I just yep. don't know how we're going to see liquidity for all these monsters. I just don't know how that's going to happen, and it's the employees <laughs> that are going to get squeezed. I don't know either. I don't know. Um, we'll we'll be talking about it on this podcast though. For sure. <laughs> we will. We will for sure. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, um, as long as I'm still on this podcast in a couple of years, when we see these things coming to fru- fruition, we're either going to see, you know, exits in the 20 billion range, 15 billion range pretty regularly and and or IPOs for all these cyber companies. Or we're going to just see all the down rounds squeezing the crap out of everything and, you know, yeah. all of the employees getting squished. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be going to be a lot of consolidation uh, on the cheap. Yeah. All right. So our next one, uh, Exonius, um, I believe they became a unicorn about a year ago. I think it's been just about 12 months since the last raise. This is a Series E, brings funding total to $665 million. Uh, as an employee of Exonius, uh, Katie, any, anything you want to add? Um, not much to add. Yes, this is our Series E for $200 million, um, led by Excel. And so, yeah, the, the total funding is three ninety five, And the valuation at this point is $2.6 billion, which is, which is pretty great. Uh, I, are we a unicorn or a duocorn? I'm not sure. Um, but it's pretty exciting. The, the fact is we didn't necessarily need this round, um, but our founders wanted it to, uh, as Andrew said in the last segment, build a better product faster. Um, we've been mm-hmm. continuing to grow, you know, year on year, we've more than doubled our revenue our customer count and we've, you know, I joined in October, mid October, and I think I was employee 240 something. Um, And we're up around, we're well, well over 300 now. I don't know exactly how many employees, but by this spring, we're going to be just under 500 employees. And that's going to allow us just to increase the product, um, do more marketing, which is great for me. so it's pretty exciting because it was a smart move to get to where we want to be faster, but it wasn't this necessary, necessary like, oh, my God, if we don't get this, we're SOL. Right, so right. Every, everybody's pretty excited. It's lots of lots of big news. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what what happens in the future. We just launched our SaaS product a, a couple weeks ago. And there's more to come. So it's it's been pretty crazy, pretty busy. Yeah, I heard uh, it sounds very similar to uh, when Netscope raised their last round. You know, it was a, a similar situation, it sounds like, where they said they, they didn't really need it, you know, but, you know, they, they took it because it, it would help them, you know, better position the, the company you know, grow a bit more, you know, market a bit more, you know, before. And in Netscope's case, you know, they've been saying for a while that uh, they intend to IPO. 
So, um, yeah, I could absolutely see um, uh, Exonius going going that direction. You know, it's it's uh, uh, on this list of fifty. It, it's certainly probably in the top ten. You know that that I would tag as as a likely uh, IPO. You know, being able to IPO in this market. Yeah, I, I think the official line for Exonius is that going public is not a goal. It's a tool to be able to achieve an objective. And the objective, our CEO always says, is to continue to l- deliver value and become the system of record for every organization's yeah. infrastructure. Sorry, Tyler, that's what we want to do. <laughs> we will continue our world domination. There's room for more than one. There's room for there more is, than one system of record. There is room for more than one. I, I, our goal is to become the system of record for every company's infrastructure. My guess is we're not going to get every company on the planet. Good goal. I mean, it- I mean, it's not like uh, Active Directory doesn't have any. Oh, wait. Hmm. <laughs> Tyler is absent here. He's silent. No, He's I, 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 yeah, I intentionally <laughs> am keeping my mouth shut here. I want Katie and I want all of Axonius to enjoy the spotlight on this raise. It's a it's a meaningful raise. Um, I'm sure it was unwarranted, not unwarranted, unneeded, right? It's It's not a needed raise. They didn't need the capital. But that's what happens to good companies, right? They get preempted and investors beat down their door until the until the founders go, okay, we can use this to do these things. Here's the amount we're going to go ahead and take. And we're going to speed up the, the acquisition of the of the market segment that we want to try to corner the entire segment on. So um, no, I'm, I'm happy for you guys, Exonius. I'm excited for you guys. I think this puts a great line in the sand of a definition of a market that, you know, that my company, I won't even mention the name, so I don't stomp on the spotlight here, but that we're going to come after too. And I think it's just, um, it's a great space for you guys and congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think, you know, we're joking around a second ago about becoming the system of record for every organization. Yes, of course, that's our goal. But like I said, we're not going to have every company on the planet. And I think this round does validate the market. When Exonius was started, you know, back in in 2017, there just weren't that many companies doing this. And now the market is getting crowded, really crowded with real competitors and then quasi competitors. And I think that's a good thing because if you don't have competition, there is no market. There is no no need. There's two of us that matter. The rest are all ankle biters, and we can leave it at that. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, I, I definitely agree with you. This market will be uh, – uh, there's there's a saying that I agree with, that all markets go to 70, 30, 10, okay? So, or, sorry, seven, 60, 30, 10. 60% to the owner of the market, the winner of the market. 30% to second place and 10% to third. Everybody else is irrelevant, Right. And if that's if we do believe that that's the case of most market dynamics, given enough time, you need to accelerate into being the 60. Right. That's what you have to shoot for. And so that's what this money, I'm sure, is designed for. Um, You know, Jupiter One's going for that same 60 percent. And I think it's going to be a great one two battle uh, between the two of us as we move forward. So it's a very smart raise and and very well executed. And realistically, even, you know, taking both of our companies out of it. Let's say there is another company that is second place, a 30% market share of a market that really should be part of every company's tool set. That ain't so bad. Yeah, the TAM is huge. The total addressable market here is absolutely enormous, and that's why you're seeing the funding sizes you're seeing. Yeah. All right. Uh, for the next uh, few funding announcements here, I'm going to do a speed read through them, and then we can jump back to whichever ones you find interesting enough to talk about, just because there's a bunch of them. I, I don't think they're all necessarily worth talking about, um, you know. but I, I do want to talk about a couple of them. So first, uh, and, and this is, as Tyler noticed a uh, uh, few episodes ago, I, I do order these uh, by the amount raised. And um, the first one here is Cider Security. The title says raised that they raised 32 million, but if you actually read the article, they say it's 38 million. You know, so maybe it's one of those, uh, you know, somebody came in late on the round or something like that. But um, for what they call an application security operating system, and I'm not a big fan of this, you know, kind of co-opting the term operating system to mean that you're building a platform. I, I guess platform isn't cool to say anymore. 
you know, basically, I think they're trying to say that they're covering a lot of ground with their product. They intend to kind of boil that small AppSec ocean. But, um, yeah, it's it's not a DAST approach, so they're, they're not doing necessarily vulnerability management there. You know, it, it, it's almost more of like a CSPM approach, but within AppSec, you know, where they're trying to, um, you know, kind of transparently add, make it easier and and pull out friction uh, of the process of of getting security uh, in, into the uh, the the dev process. But uh, so yeah, if that's what they're trying to do, more power to them. I, I just uh, you know kind of raises my hackles. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the second or third time I've seen somebody describe their product as an operating system when it's not an you know what we traditionally think of as an operating system. I think it's more confusing than uh, uh, buzzwordy. But um, next one there is uh, Series B funding for Cyber Six Skill, uh, thirty-five million dollars Series B led by Rev Venture. Um, they provide threat intel feeds. Uh, next is Blink. Uh, so Blink uh, is you know this is a twenty million Series A uh, led by Lightspeed and uh, kind of a workflow platform. So I'm thinking. You know, like almost like a SOAR, you know, but specifically for cloud and security operations tasks. And Bright Security is next. Uh, also $20 million Series A. Uh, they are doing DAST, so another AppSec vendor here. Uh, DAST for both web and API stuff, saying, you know, they can do it quickly with no false positives. That's a tough claim to, you know, generally in the, in the web space and API space, Um you know, it's really false positive heavy, so kind of kind of hard to swallow. Uh, Viso Trust, uh, eleven million dollars, tackling the third party cyber risk management market. Um, Secure Code. This was kind of weird one. There wasn't really a press release on it. Um, kind of scrappy looking, judging from the website, but uh, raised a two point five million dollars seed round. Uh, seemed like they might be similar to. Bastion, I wrote zero Bastion, <laughs> but it should be Bastion zero, right? Uh, we, we talked to their CEO last week, but that, that sounds like what they're talking about, like uh, um, doing some kind of peer-to-peer -peer tunneling, uh, like zero trust network access or uh, software defined perimeter. All right, I will take a breath there. And uh, any of these you guys want to, Tyler, Katie, you want to dive a bit deeper into? I want to talk about Securco's, uh, on their website, their graphics. Um, yes. <laughs> in particular, I, it, the moving, the moving dot, dot pixelized version, Securco.com, the dot pixelized, pixelized version of the earth is, um, it's, it's entrancing. I could sit here and look at it for days, quite frankly. And then and they directly the follow the, the directly really? below I that feel are, it, Tyler. There were, yeah, directly below that are two cans connected by strings. So, yeah. You kind uh, of on have... a white background, like, like it, it looks like something you'd make uh, on a slide in approximately five seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, they got points. room for improvement. But, hey, they now, ha now they have the money to actually hire somebody to do the work. Yes. Yeah. And that's uh, I, I would suggest using some of that uh, seed round to, to work on the branding here. Like Secure Co., it's tough to get a more generic name than secure company shortened. But um, you know what that background reminds me of though, Tyler and Katie, what does that remind you of that, that style, like the kind of dot matrix, like, I don't, I don't know if it's just me, but it reminds me of Norse's uh, pew pew map. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. It's for a sure. very yeah, similar style. Black background. And, you know, They're thinking kind of about the telephone game and thinking, yeah. Uh, you know, that was probably pretty secure communication. There was no digital anything involved in it. It was it was pretty well encrypted. And if you Looks keep like scrolling, that moving background stays back there lurking in the background. It keeps oh reappearing as you scroll through the page. It doesn't go away. No, this is very, <laughs> very old school. Like, like somebody whipped out their... Uh, 2002 copy of uh, Microsoft uh, front page and made this. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, they got some work to do on their messaging, too. It's a little bit wordy and dense and text heavy. But hey, you know what? Everybody starts somewhere. Good for them. I'm glad they got that early round. Put it to work hiring a PMM and uh, a web designer. You guys will be fine. Agreed. Any others that you guys want to talk about here? Before we move on to number 13. Mm, nothing for me. I'm 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 ready for for uh, squirrels and memes, man. That's that's my favorite part of the show. You just skipped over the SEC, Tyler. That's because uh, I don't like the SEC. That's the government. Nobody likes the government. <laughs> so uh, it's a pretty quick one. Uh, basically, uh, obviously, you know, if you have a breach in your public company, you know that oh. that's uh, that's something that you would need to report to your shareholders. You know, if you're going to be a uh, responsible public company, you know, and, and report risks to them. Uh, how but did, now, how, ba- how, how did our fearless leader put something so important at the bottom of the list? How did that even happen? It's just the order things happen. Money's more important. So acquisitions and fundings come first. Oh, uh, okay. But no, this one is, I was just joking because this one is very important. I did, you know, if they're going to enforce it with teeth and actually give fines and actually make it something that has to be done, I think this is a very important rule to have come out, a very important, um, I hate to call it a law because it's not really a law, but um, regulation to come out of the SEC, right? So, so, yes, exactly. This is a bit of a spicy take. This is the first time you'll ever hear me say anything coming from the SEC or the government is actually important. So it is, um, I, I, I think it's already required. Like if it's material, you know, it's it, basically the same rule that covers, uh, you know, making acquisitions, anything like that. If, if it's material to the company's uh Financial well-being, they they have to report it. Um, but uh, the the main difference here is they're setting a time limit on it. Four days. You've got if you have a breach, you get a. So <laughs> I, I'm I'm feeling Equifax all over this. Who took uh, I, I think a little it was something like 41 days after they knew about the breach that they finally reported it, and they had some uh, I think two executives uh, actually sell some stock before it was reported and after Ooh. they knew about it. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, if that's a response to that, it's a pretty late response, but, uh, yeah, certainly I, th- I think there should be, I don't think it's a bad thing to put a, a, a time limit around how long you can know about it before you let your shareholders know. Yeah, no, I, I don't think, think so. this I don't, is good. I agree that it's important. I do worry though, four days, there are a lot of companies that wouldn't quite for, for, real reasons, not made up reasons, but real reasons that they might not know which end is up after four days. So mm-hmm. that feels a little quick to that me. That sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's maybe that's part of the reason they're doing it. You know, like when we yeah. saw log for J happen, like there, there are some, yeah, I'm not going to name names, but there are some vendors that took a very long time to let their customers know whether or not they were affected by log for J. And I'm talking like yeah. a month in some cases. I was like, I was going to say the exact same thing that Katie said. Four days is super aggressive. It's almost impossible to get stuff through legal, let alone, you know, mm-hmm. any kind of, of larger scale uh, handling of an incident like this. You know, spinning up the PR, the legal, the product to understand how to fix it. Four days is really, really aggressive. But maybe that's what people need. They, they might need the fire lit to be able to achieve anywhere near four days, right? Yeah, now keep in mind, this is just a proposal. So maybe, you know, sometimes you got to really push those boundaries. You know, if they're saying four days, maybe it becomes really seven days, whatever the case may be. I don't know, obviously, but but yeah, four days is a lot to get everything done, especially if they're still wondering technically what the scope of the problem is. It is a proposal, but they did already vote three to one to issue the proposal. They just haven't haven't formalized it yet. So I'm, that's why I'm kind of treating it as if it's a kind of a foregone conclusion. Never too late to negotiate. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that is a trend we're seeing with the federal government, you know, being more cyber uh, savvy and more aggressive. You know, we had that great conversation uh, last week with um, oh, I'm going to the CEO of. Um, all right, I'm just going to go back so to find her name. Sharon Goldberg, uh, CEO of Bastion Zero. 
uh, you know, where we were talking about how surprising that White House memo uh, was on on yeah. Zero Trust earlier this year, uh, and the executive order also. Like, like uh, I think at every step of this, we've been surprised that you know, not only are they on top of it, you know, they're not trying to push us to you know the the status quo, but in front of the status quo with a lot of this stuff, uh, which generally I, I would rather that than than the alternative. Yeah, no, this is definitely not a bad thing. It's just, you know, when you get faced with something that's so different from what it has been and so imminent, it's like, whoa, whoa, am I going to be able to do this? Not me. I, I won't be involved in any of this. But as a, as a company, um, you know, an enterprise, especially a massive public company, that's a tight timeline. Not not doable i know the double negative um it is doable but it is it would be a massive push for a big organization yeah um yeah and some people were asking in the discord you know what what why is four days unreasonable and uh i haven't actually been through the process you know but i've read plenty of these uh and they come out they're usually issued as an 8k and I'm sure there's some formality you have to go through, you know, like Tyler mentioned, you know, having to work with legal, uh, legal to um, to issue that that 8K and, and, and get that out. And like you, you've got to make sure it's an actual breach. You've got to, you know, figure out. Uh, I mean, typically, if you're going to say it, you don't want to just alarm your customers. You want some idea of how bad is it? How many customers is it affecting? You know, if if we're required to tell the whole public that we had this breach, you know, from the company's eyes, I, I'd rather also be sending a notice out to all affected customers with some details to, you know, uh, you know, kind of make them feel, you know, like you've got a handle on it, like you know what's going on, you know. So to just, we've seen companies come out and say, there's a breach, you know, and give no details. And from a PR standpoint, that's very bad because then what's going to happen is, you know, the the public, Twitter, journalists are, are just going to let that roll around their imagination and uh, you lose the narrative. And, you know, the, the version they come up with is often going to be much worse than the reality. So you, right. you don't want to lose the, control of that. The speculation can really, really hurt a company. There's also the flip side where the beginning of an investigation, it's likely that a company is going to see a smaller scope of a compromise and then as they dig in deeper it might grow bigger doesn't happen all the time but it can happen and you yeah. neither want to under report nor create market fud in these cases because breaches are going to happen they are a risk factor in running a business the key here is quantifying it without creating hysteria and you can't do that unless you're very intentional and systematic about investigating a breach. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, yeah, I, I think the big deal is 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 really from the um, the PR perspective. And and honestly, if you look at some of the better handled breaches in recent history, you know, like uh, like FireEye before they split out Mandiant, finding out about Solar Winds. Um, they, that was less than 24 hours, I think, of discovering it. They not only had an announcement written up, but they had IOCs they were sharing with the, the community, uh, on exactly what was compromised. Here's the hashes of the files, you know, because some of their pen testing tools got, got leaked as well. So certainly I think the best practice, you know, the, the precedent that's been set is you should be able to get an announcement like that together in a day or two uh, from from what we're seeing out there, certainly for a large public company. You know, so I, I think that gauntlet has been has been dropped and maybe emboldened the SEC to, to put this four day requirement in. Shall we move on to squirrels? We shall. So I think um, <laughs> Gus made a meme of his own feel free to share that for folks seeing the video version of this uh this podcast um oh that's a must share but you gotta you gotta preface it adrian we have to say 
again, we have to go back to the fact that today is Mario right. Day. Yeah, today and, is and Mario help Day. Everyone, right, and I was too stupid to know ahead of time why it was Mario Day, and he had I to explain too. it to me. But, hey, you know what? What our wonderful team did, I hope they have it ready and prepped, and I've bought them enough time. There it is. Uh, the, <laughs> the three Mario Brothers and Sisters Super ESW 3D All-Stars. I absolutely love this photo. I like it best because I'm flying. The, the cool people fly. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Oh, um, right. it, well it's done, a great power. Yeah. And what, what you don't know is that graphic was prepared like five minutes after I introduced the fact that it was Mario Day. It was, that was some very quick photoshopping. But anyway, it really, goes, it really goes to the point of how kick ass our team is. The team here is pretty amazing. It, so great job back there, guys. Absolutely. And, and so the squirrel story today is just this great thread that Bug Crowd put out uh, where instead of March Madness, it's meme madness. And it's a contest uh, where people share their favorite memes. And, and it's hilarious because some of the memes that people have replied with are kind of throwing shade on Bug Crowd. But I'm sure Bug Crowd is aware that that's going to happen. And, you know, they're they're cool enough that they can they can handle some criticism. You know, they can be cool. And uh there, there's some great memes in there. There's some not so great memes in there, but there's some really good ones. Uh, yeah, definitely they're worth scrolling through look. this. It, it was uh, a few had me chuckling out loud for sure. Yeah, like the uh, like the Peter Parker, uh, Doctor Strange one, where Peter Parker's saying, "Can I release my vulnerability write-up?" Which is essentially just a professional roast of your organization. And he That's says, "That's exactly that feels, what I'm looking at, actually." Yeah, that feels <laughs> weird, but I'll allow it. That that was probably my my favorite out of the bunch. Yeah, I but, know the guy uh, that put that that kicked us off. Uh, Samuel's his name, and he's just he's he's just done an amazing job with the marketing side of this. So definitely, if you get a chance to look through this tweet storm, it's well worth it. Well worth it. There's tons of good ones in here. You will waste time, but it will lighten your mood for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't wait to see the uh, the ones that win. Uh, submit by March 12th. So you still have time to submit some memes to this thread and uh, win whatever they're... Okay, so there's uh, eight memes compete in a tournament. So I guess they're going to have some kind of tournament shootout to see which meme is the memest of all the memes. So I think we should get our, our crack meme staff of uh, Johnny and Gus back there cranking it out and, and do we submit could. one or two. Yeah, we, we, we could submit the one that Gus put together earlier. Uh, well, I, it's I like less it. of a meme than like an inside joke, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they can come up with some killer memes to use, though. So let's get on it. Absolutely. Team. Absolutely. Let's win this. Team ESW. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Katie and Tyler, for joining me today. A very fun show today. We, we ran long on, on, uh, on a few of these segments, but I feel like it was totally worth it. I was waiting for you guys to say something before I read us out. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Bye. Thank you, Tyler. And a big thanks to everyone watching or listening to this week's episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. Bye.